throughout life, and uh, that's the thing we're learning to lean on Jesus. I've been preaching a series uh, about overcoming. As a matter of fact, there's one more, and we've been talking about overcoming, the overcoming series, and today is, is a little bit tough, so I want to laugh a little bit. Is it okay to have a little bit of fun just to begin here? Because you know when you're facing the feelings of futility that we're going to talk about, it's hard to, it's hard to see past the circumstances and struggles we're going through. So I want, I want to start out with this. Uh, by the way, Mark, you'll hear me brag about this church. I got the best church family in the world. And, uh, you know, this is a, a wonderful, unique experience for me. And, and uh, there's a You've probably heard this before, but um, you might have a redneck church if, and there's what it is, there's five or six of them. You know what, how many of you say I'm a redneck? You know, hey, you're right. You know, you might have a redneck church if people ask when Jesus fed the 5,000 whether that fish was a catfish or a bass. <laughs> and what bait did you use to catch them? Here's the second one. You might have a redneck church if the pastor says, I'd like Bubba to help take up an offering. Five guys stand up and two women. <laughs> you might have a redneck church if the opening day of deer season is recognized as an official church holiday. <laughs> You might have a redneck church if a member of the church requests to be buried in their four-wheel drive truck because it ain't never been in a hole they can't get out of. <laughs> <laughs> or you might have a redneck church if the choir is known as the OK Corral. <laughs> I like this one. You might have a redneck church if the congregation of 500 members there are only seven names in the church directory. <laughs> it's great to laugh. And again, sometimes we may be facing or having feelings where we just are having a tough time. Feelings of futility. It was Solomon who spoke not only for his generation, but he speaks also of ours. When he wrote Ecclesiastes 1, Verses 2 through 8. He said, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work? <clears throat> Generations come and go, but nothing really changes. The sun uh, rises and sets and hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and north, here and there, twisting back and forth, getting nowhere. The rivers run into the sea. But the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows again to the sea. Everything is so weary and tiresome. No matter, no matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. It was Leonard Wolf, who was literary, literary editor of the nation, he said this. He said, I clearly see that I have achieved practically nothing. The world today and the history of the human anthro during the past five to seven years would be exactly the same if I had played ping pong instead of sitting on committees and writing books and memoranda. I have therefore to make a rather anonymous confession that I have in a long life ground through between 150,000 and 200,000 hours of perfectly useless work. Now, these were two guys that you invite to your next party, right? <laughs> you know, these guys, both Solomon and Leonard Wolf, they sounded like they'd reached that point where it was a point of despair. It was a point of no return. And they have decided, them, they had decided that there isn't any meaning to life. And the accomplishments that they had accomplished ring hollow. So what's the use of any trying? Have you ever been there in your life? What's the use of even trying? I think I was there before uh, with the MEF fund and the situation we had. I was kind of like that. It was, why even try? How are we going to get ahead? Those are tough, tough feelings. But what's the use? You know, if you think this way, what's the use of even getting up in the morning? What's the use of even going to work when I know I'll never get ahead? What's the use of teaching my kids 
trying to train them to do something this way when I know when they get out of the house, they're just going to go do their own thing. Or maybe you're thinking, how can I live the Christian life and live it to the fullest when I know that I'm struggling and I'm failing and I can't do it the way it needs to be done? So what do you do? You say, why should I even try? And when you feel that way, it's obviously not a good thing. But I can tell you that you are in company of many people. And uh, especially even now in our generation, both Christian and non-Christian. So what's defined futility? The dictionary defines futility in this way. First of all, it says the quality of having no useful result. Uselessness. And it second says the lack of importance or purpose. Frivolousness. The fact of the matter is, is that every one of us in this room have felt that at one time or another in our lives. But we usually get over it. It's a time, it's a situation, it's happened, and, and we feel those feelings, but sometimes we get over it. But there are those people sometimes that find themselves living with feelings of futility day in and day out. And it's something that they need help with. It's something where they need rescue and to work through. Because when you're in those feelings of futility, I'm telling you, you're, you're landlocked. You're stuck. You can't get past it, these feelings of futility. And if we can't get past it, sometimes we can't be used or experience the fullness of Christ that we were designed for because we're stuck in the feelings of futility. If you have sermon notes, you're welcome to use them. If they're distraction, place them to the side. But the question I'd like to begin with is what causes these feelings of futility? Where do they come from? I have four of the most common causes that I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to look at some practical steps to overcome them. Now, I could have a list this big, but I think these will basically help us to understand the issue or the problem. What causes the feelings of futility? The first one is unfulfilled dreams. Unfulfilled dreams cause those feelings of futility. Maybe you thought that when I have a family or when I have this situation or this job, when I have the job, I'm going to go up the corporate ladder. Or when I have my family, I, I want my family to be raised up and, and I want it to be this way. Or, uh, you know, I had all these things that I wanted to do when I was younger and guess what? I'm still at that point where it didn't happen in my life. I come to the realization that life isn't everything that I thought that it was going to be. And maybe you haven't even reached stage two of stage ten of the point that you had, the goals that you set in your life. And instead of dealing with life circumstances and the reality of the moment, you dwell and your thoughts are what might have been. What, what, what would my life have been if, if I had a different I thought I had some luck in my life. You know, everybody thinks, I wish I just had some breaks, lucky breaks in my life. I wonder what my life would have been if I'd have married a different spouse. I wonder what my life would have been if I had this different job or if I'd have made these different decisions in my life. And somehow now, because you're living in that what might have been, you're like living in drudgery of the life that is rather than the life that you've always wanted. I had these dreams and they're unfulfilled. So you have these. That's what causes the feelings of futility. Here's another one. What causes these feelings of futility is confusing success with significance. How many of you loved Coach Tom Landry when he was Coach Jeff? You betcha. I, coach Tom Landry, Cowboys coach back then, you know, we had Calvin Hill and Roger Staubach. That was the time. I really loved Coach Landry. Years ago when they won the Super Bowl, here's what he said. He made this ob observation. He said the overwhelming emotion in a few days among the players on the Dallas Cowboy football team was how empty that goal was. There must be something more. I mean, the Super Bowl is the pinnacle of life, right? If I get to the Super Bowl, everybody... Everybody in sports is like, make it to the NBA Finals, make it to the NCAA Playoffs. I mean, it's, it's especially the Cowboys, you make it to the Super Bowl, and then when they got there, he says, they were disappointed. This is it. Because that success that you and I have experienced in our life, when we get there, guess what? It goes away. 
We may have had the experience, but the feelings of success and victory kind of go away. And you realize, this is it? I spent my whole life doing this, and this is it? <clears throat> Sometimes we confuse success with significance, and it causes futility, feelings of futility. Here's the next one. <clears throat> Personal, spiritual failure. Personal, spiritual failure. I want you to know that everybody in this room has experienced some level of failure. There's not one perfect person in this room. We've all experienced failure at some level. But some of us may have experienced a little deeper failure than others. Maybe you're, you got fired from your job. Maybe in your marriage it's, it's kind of struggled. Or you raised your kids with these certain values and you feel like you failed as a dad. I've been there. Because of my kids. And it's like, well, you know, it, you just feel those things sometimes. Uh, sometimes we give in to a temptation and it blows our Christian testimony and maybe our credibility. And when those things happen and you and I have experienced failure, instead of accepting that some failure helps us, what does it help us do? It makes me stronger. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. It makes me grow. We, we're going to experience failure. And sometimes instead of accepting God's forgiveness when we've failed, what we do is we begin to do this. Because of our failure, we say, what's the use of even trying? And so we give up. You know, I can't be what God wants me to be. So because of our personal or spiritual failure, we say, what's the use? And so those cause feelings of futility. Here's another one. How about a lack of support system? Everybody needs somebody. I say this is important. You, you all need five to seven people in your life that, you, that you're very close to here within the life of the church. I know many of you have families. And when you have family, guess what? You probably don't need anybody else because you've got family. But I do know that there's some of us here that whether our family is gone or our family has moved out of town or we're here, guess what? You don't have anybody. Where's your support system? And so that's very, very vital of us having five to seven people that we know will help us when we come in those struggles of life. But what if you do this? What if you're trying to get in a circle and nobody gets you in? I want to be in your circle. But if you don't let that person in, guess what happens? Tons of futility. I've been trying to get into your circle and I keep getting rejected. And guess what? Why try? And you give up. Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend is always loyal and a brother is born to what? To help in time of need. We need five to seven people. You may read this verse or have heard this verse before and say that's really true. But the problem is I have nobody to help me up or to dust me off or to pick me up or to encourage me. I have no one. So what's the use of even trying? There's no one here to help me. And so those feelings of futility come in because of a lack of a support system. Now, as I said before, I could probably come up with more reasons, but here is enough to help us understand. And by the way, if I give you any more, you'd probably leave this morning a little bit depressed. But since we've identified them now, here's what really needs to come, and that's this, the steps. How do I overcome? Let me give you some steps. If you're at this point in your life right now and you're feeling those feelings of utility, uh, I want you to know that, that there's help. There is help. We want to help you. God wants to help you. We need to help each other. But you know if you're in those feelings and you're feeling these feelings of futility, uh, you know it's not healthy. And it's not only not healthy for you, but it's not healthy for those around you. So you say, what can I do about it? Well, here's a list of four things that will help you. And I'm not promising you a quick cure. Because it's taken a while for you to get where you're at. And it's going to take a little while to get you out of that, to get you back where you need to be. So here's the first step. The process. The first step is to renew your commitment. I gotta renew my commitment. See, if you are a follower of Christ, there's some point in your life where you can say that I chose to follow Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And whether you feel like it right now or not, you've got to renew that commitment 
to let God know that I am willing to not only make an effort to overcome, but I want you to help me overcome. I'm coming to you. I'm leaning on you. I need your help. So if you're there and you're a Christian and you're feeling these feelings, that's the first step. Remit it. But if you're here this morning and you have never taken a step of faith, my encouragement is to you is that's a beginning start for you. Take a step towards Jesus. He's taking a step towards you. He wants to come and help you. You've got to take a step towards Him and invite Him to be your leader of your life, your Lord and your Savior. And that is the first step. One time King David, who was a man after God's own heart, he experienced a personal failure in his life. You know the story, he, uh, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. And then he wanted to cover it up, so what did he do? He murdered. He, 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 he set it out so that this person, her, her husband, would be killed so he could have her. Two things, horrible uh, sin in his life. And yet he comes to God. He takes a step to renew what he once had. And it says in Psalms 51, 12, he said this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. See, did David, did David claim to be filled with joy when he prayed this prayer? When he prayed this prayer, there was no joy. He was absolutely miserable. So he asked God, would you restore the joy that I once had with you? I want to renew my commitment. But did he do this on his own? Absolutely. He knew I'm too weak. I can't do this on my own. So I want you to grant me a willing spirit to what? To sustain me. I can't do this on my own. See, part of the reason some of us are suffering from futility is because when we get knocked down, who do we rely on? Ourselves. We're learning to lean on ourselves, and then we fall back down. We have to learn to lean on Jesus. And every time we try and we fail, we struggle. Why try? But we need to call on God to restore us and to give us the strength that we need to overcome, to make it. Psalms 23, verse 3 says this. It says, God renews my strength. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. See, whether you're able to accept this as true or not at this present moment, God wants you to know nothing more than I want to restore your joy. God wants to restore your joy. He wants to renew your strength. He wants to give you the power and the ability to overcome. Now, I know sometimes we try to be macho, especially us guys. I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to show you how tough I am. But my friends, you've got to let your guard down. You've got to humble yourself and say, okay, God, I know it's about you, and I want to renew my commitment. I want to take a step towards you, and you need to allow him to come to you and do that new work in your life. So it's a renewed commitment is the first step. Here's the second step. Resist the negative influences. Resist the negative influences. You know the old saying that says, misery loves company? Well, it's very true. There are people who are just like you in very circumstances, sometimes worse circumstances than you are. And whether you realize it or not, they're trying to hold you back. They're trying everything they can to keep you down because of the negative influence. In addition to that, you have Satan, the enemy, the roaring lion who's doing everything he can to make you stay right there in the futility of your thinking and your feelings. Why? Because when you're there, you can't do anything to... You're stuck. You're not effective in living for God because you're stuck. And that's right where he wants you. See, Paul was writing to the Corinthian church and he expressed this fear. It's in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. He said, I think that somehow you'll be led away from your pure and simple devotion to Christ just as Eve was deceived by the Spirit. See, normally when we think of, of spiritual attacks or spiritual warfare, we think of some huge, obvious, and extreme situation or temptation. But Paul's fear is here, he's saying that Christians are led away from their pure and simple devotion to Christ. And that's exactly what happens when we allow other people to pull us 
But we'll see it. They want to keep us right there in a state of futility so that we will lose our pure and simple devotion that we once had known. Proverbs 25, 19 says this. Putting confidence in an unreliable person is like chewing with a toothache or walking on a broken foot. Now, I know you know that chewing with a toothache and walking on a broken foot are very painful, aren't they? They're very painful, but they're not nearly as painful as the life that you're going to have if you continue to be influenced by the negative forces around you. So resist negative influence. Here's the third one. Rediscover your purpose. I love the little plaque that I have. I can see it in my office. It's a cross that says the Lord will fulfill his purpose for my life. I can't tell you how many times I said that over and over and over and over when I was struggling with the feelings of utility with some, a situation that I went through. And it wasn't just a one day. It seemed like it was this long. And I kept saying that over and over. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for my life. But I have to tell you, there were days that I thought, what's going on here? Have you forgotten me, God? Why am I facing this? And those feelings of futility were heavy. But in the process of going through that event, in the process of continually saying that verse and believing that God had a plan for me, guess what? He brought me through. My purpose, why I went through all that, was what? To be right here. And as hard as that was to go through, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to change a thing to be where I'm at right now. But I had to rediscover, I had to rediscover the purpose of why I was going through those things. In his book, Teaching the Elephants to, to Dance, James Belasco, he describes this, how trainers shackle young elephants with heavy chains to deeply embedded states. He says in that way, the elephant learns to stay in place. Older, powerful elephants never try to leave, even though they have the strength to just pull that stake up out of the ground. Their conditioning has limited their movements. With only a small metal bracelet around their foot that's not attached to anything, guess what they do? They stand in place. The stakes are actually gone. There's no chain there, but there's just this metal bracket. Like powerful elephants, people are bound by their earlier conditioned restraints. If you're suffering from futility, it is a learned behavior that has taken place over time and is as limiting to your spiritual progress as the unattached chain around an elephant's foot. Yet if the, if the circus tent caught on fire uh, and the elephant sees the flames and he smells the smoke, he forgets his old conditioning and he runs for his life. My friends, if you're suffering from futility, you need to realize that your spiritual house is on fire. And that means if it's on fire, you've got to do something about it before everything crashes in. Remember 1 Corinthians 9, 24-26 says this. Remember that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. You also must run in such a way that you will win. All athletes practice strict self-control. They do it to win a prize that will fade away. That will fade away. But we do it for an eternal prize. So I run straight to the goal with purpose in every step. I'm not like a boxer who misses his punches. See, sometimes in life, my friends, in running this race, we get knocked down. We get tripped up. And when we do, what do we say? I give up. Watch this clip real quick.
If I had fallen down, I probably would have given up hope. probably would have given up hope, and maybe you would have as well. But friends, God has given us purpose. As believers, we've got to eye the prize. We've got to keep our eyes on the finish line and know that that's our goal. Your purpose in life is to follow Christ, to win the race, and not just sit on the sidelines and worry about what might have been. It's time to remind yourself day after day, moment by moment, but you're not on this earth just for yourself. You've been called to a higher purpose, one that brings glory to God. Even if life has handed you some bad times, even if you have fallen down, even if you haven't accomplished everything that you'd like to, and even if you have failed in life, the one thing that never changes is your purpose, to live like a God-loving, Christ-following, kingdom-growing child of God. Friends, rediscover your purpose. And here's last. I know we're over, but I'm almost done. This is so important. Rest in God's peace. <laughs> rest in God's <laughs> peace. You know, so many times we think that God is grading us, and so many times we think we have to have this accomplished to, to our credit to be accepted. But God just simply wants you to rest in Him. To lean on Him. To let God do His work in you. It's time to quit trying to please ourselves and everybody else around us and rest in the fact that God loves me and He loves you just the way you are. Let me read these two scriptures that are basically uh, promises from Jesus and let them be promises that you claim today. Matthew 11, 28-30 says, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke fits perfectly, and the burden I give you is light. And in John 14, 27, it says, I'm leaving you with this gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give you isn't the peace that the world gives, so don't be troubled or afraid. Maybe you've heard these promises before. They say, oh, they're really good. And that's another thing to read them. It's another thing to meditate on them and allow them to penetrate to our very soul. So I would say to you, if you have homework today, I want you to go home. I want you to take these two scriptures. I want you to put your feet up on the couch. And I want you to read these two scriptures over and over and over and over again until God comes in such a way that you're leaning and relaxing and allowing him to help you to rest in his peace. He wants nothing more than for you to rest in his peace. So if that's you today and you find yourselves experiencing these feelings, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to know that you can take steps. First of all, renew your commitment. Make your commitment to him. I promise he'll help you. Resist the negative influences that may be in your life. And then rediscover your purpose. God has you all here for a purpose. And then simply just rest in his peace, God's peace. He says, come to me. So take that step today to come to him and allow him to minister to your spirit. Let's stand together and sing number 527. Let's just sing the first verse and the fifth verse of the closing. I invite you, if you'd like to just pause and say, Lord, I just want to